Well, good morning to everyone. Everybody good? Good. It's good to be in God's house, right? You know, there's uh, a lot of things that happen in our world as we walk through it day by day. Sometimes it seems like there's some unrest. Sometimes it seems like there's some uncertainty. Sometimes it seems like the waters are just kind of roiling around all around us. And yet we come into God's house and there's a peace. There's a, a confidence. There's a calm. Part of that, I was looking in Ephesians chapter 1, and that's not where we're going to be this morning. We're going to be in first, uh, Second Thessalonians chapter 1 in just a moment. But it speaks about the fact that, that God has exalted or lifted Jesus far above. Now, that verse goes on, but that's enough, right? He is far above. What's he above? He's above all the principalities, all the powers, all the rulers of darkness, all the spiritual wickedness in high places. He is above. He's above. He's been exalted. He's seated at the right hand of God the Father. He's not only in control, but he's in charge. And so we come to him this morning. And we're going to read some scriptures, the first five verses of 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, as we begin a series there this morning. And we're going to be talking about the question, ready or not, Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is fitting, because your faith grows exceedingly, and the love of every one of you all abounds toward each other, so that we ourselves boast of you among the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure, which is manifest evidence of the righteous judgment of God, that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God, for which you also suffer. <clears throat> Father, we ask again that in the moments that are before us that we would hear the voice of God as you speak to us from your holy word and in the power and presence of your Holy Spirit, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> the resistance has always been present toward the message and the mission of the church is undeniable. Ever since the beginning of the church, there has been this resistance, this pushback against its message and against its mission. The ebb and flow of such pressure rises and falls with the times, it seems. Some days it's less, some days it's more. Now, I'm a person who prefers not to live in the world of what if. Some of you might like to live there, where you try to devise in your mind situations that may or may not happen. I, I, I can't live there. In fact, if somebody starts saying to me, what if, I just kind of, turn the dial off because you don't ever really know why you want to borrow something from the future that may never become a reality. I'm more of a let's take it one day at a time and just kind of see how things unfold and deal with it when it gets here sort of a guy. However, that doesn't, that doesn't mean that I don't see opportunities for concern for the church at some point in its future. And it doesn't mean that I don't see some opportunities for intensification of opposition toward the church in its future. Now, I'm not here today as a prophet. I'm not here today to tell you that things are about to get really bad. But I'm telling you this, that opportunities always exist for the ramping up of resistance to God and to the things of God. And if Scripture is accurate which it always is, then at some point in time, there will be more heated and more pronounced and more overt animus displayed against the Lord's church. That's just a reality. The title of our message this morning is typically a declaration, one that is often used in childhood games. I don't know how many of you have ever played hide and seek. I'm not talking about between you and God. <laughs> But if you have, then you know how that works. You, 
in our world, where I grew up, you always put your head against a tree, right? And you close your eyes, supposedly, and you begin to count to 20 or whatever. And then when you finish that count, you said, what? Ready or not, here I come. Well, this day, this phrase is not meant to be a declaration. It's presented to you in the form of a question. If, if intensification of opposition comes to the church, are you ready or not? Are we ready or not? If, if something should happen where our freedoms are challenged, if, if something should happen to where the, the, the opportunity for persecution or suffering or difficulty <clears throat> was ramped up against the church, are you ready or not? Are we ready or not? Well, I think that's a question that, that is a timely question, and I think it's one that bears looking into this morning. So, so if opposition to the church should ramp up, am I ready? And if I'm not, how do I need to get ready? Because I want to tell you this, and I, I believe this with all my heart. I believe that at some point, whether sooner or later, the church will face pushback from a hostile world. It's, it's going to happen. Now, why do I say that? Well, there's a couple of reasons that I would say this. First of all, because history attests to it. Throughout the history of the church, there have been times whenever the intensification of opposition has become so heated that, that it actually is, has created the opportunity or the situation where martyrs were on the other side of that intensification of resistance. People have given their lives because the heat was so amped up and ramped up that it couldn't be avoided. History attests to it. Also, prophecy asserts this. The scriptures tell us that in the last days, evil men will wax worse and worse. In the, in the last days, perilous times will come. Scripture tells us that all who are godly in Christ Jesus will face persecution. Now, I can tell you that at, at the level that, that the context of those verses is speaking, you and I don't know what that's about. We've not been down that path. But I want to tell you that if you're part of the the, the people of God, part of the church, that those verses apply to you. And so the fact is that at some point we may well expect that there will be some things that we experience that we've not experienced before. And so we need to ask ourselves the question, if that should come today, if that should come tomorrow, next week, next month, next year, am I ready or am I not? As we look at this passage of Scripture and this letter that Paul wrote to the church at Thessalonica. It's actually the second letter that he writes to them this morning. What that church is going to help us see, what this letter is going to help us see is, is how we ourselves can face resistance in readiness because that's what we want. We want to be ready in, in light of the, fa the fact of the opportunity or the possibility that opposition may come. So how does this come to us? Well, let's look back again at the Scripture. Paul is writing this, and there's a couple of guys there with him, Silvanus and Timothy. And he, and he says he's writing to the church of the Thessalonians in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Then he says, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, this is, a, this is a greeting that's typical in letters written by Paul to the churches. And, it, and it, while it's somewhat formulaic in its presentation, it's a sort of a, a typical formula for opening up a letter, there's also more to it whenever Paul writes these words to any of those churches that he's writing to. Because when he uses the words that are here, he's talking about some things that are beyond conceptual or beyond just greeting kinds of thoughts. He's talking about things that are actual realities, things that are the, the experience of those that he's writing these words to. So whenever we start thinking about facing resistance and readiness, the first thing that I would say is that this is something that is, is possible and, and, and helpful for a people who would be a people of purpose. Paul is writing this to people who have come to know that they are a people of purpose. Now, what do I mean by that? First of all, he's talking to a people that we would, call, we would say are a called people. 
Whenever Paul writes these words to the church, he's speaking to a group of people. And the Greek word, as I've told you before, for the word church is the word ekklesia, which is a, a combination word that literally means those who are called out with a purpose. And so these people that Paul is writing to, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, he recognizes that they are a people that have been called out by God through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. These are people who are called. They have a purpose now. Those who have heard the voice of Jesus, those who have sensed the pull, the tug of the Holy Spirit in their hearts, making them aware, making them mindful of the fact that there's a need in their lives that they can't resolve, and that need can be resolved by the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And at some point in an act of resignation of their own will, they stopped and said, I will follow Jesus. And as they began to follow Jesus, they began this journey of faith, this journey of progress, this journey of process in walking with Christ. And they recognized that Jesus now has placed a calling upon their lives. And as such, they go forward understanding that they are sent into the world by this one to whom they've surrendered their lives, the Lord Jesus Christ. They are a people of purpose in that they are called. They are the church. By the way, so are we. We're every bit as much the church as the people of Thessalonica, the people of Ephesus, the people of Philippi, the people of Colossae. All of these people that Paul was writing these letters to, the people of Corinth, the people of Rome, when he says to the church, we are every bit as much the church as they are, and we live our lives every bit under the call of God upon our lives as those people of old live their call, their lives under the call of God. We're called by God. And that gives us a purpose. That, that's the, the launch into our purpose for existence. I want to tell you that these were not only a called people, but they were also a conquered people. What do I mean by that? Did some tyrant come riding into their town and, and, and exact some sort of a heavy-handed uh, dominion and rule over their lives? No, that's not what I mean at all. Whenever Paul writes to these people, he says, you are the church, but then he says this to the church. He says, grace to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. So whenever I say these are a conquered people, I'm not talking about some tyrannical despot who marched in and took control of their lives. No, I'm talking about those upon whose lives the grace and the peace of God has come to bear in such measure and in such wonder that they, through this grace and peace that has, has come to bear on their lives as it's taken hold of them they have recognized the person and the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ and these who were once resistant to God's offering and God's opportunity for salvation ha have now recognized the supreme love and the supreme mercy of everlasting God and they've been conquered by that love their hearts have been won by that love and, and, and this this unrequited and unconditional love from God has come to bear on their lives and they have have have, be, have melted underneath its warmth and its presence and now they are conquered by God and because of that they are set on purposes that are eternal and holy so whenever Paul writes grace and peace through God and the Lord Jesus Christ. He's not just saying, hello, how are you? He's saying you're living in the realities of what God has extended to you through his son, the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. You're living in the reality of what God has offered to you by his, his substitutionary death on the cross. You're living in the grace and in the peace that God provides through a relationship with himself by faith in Jesus Christ, his son. And that conquers the heart. And if you're here this morning and your heart has not been conquered by the supreme love, by the unrequited love of the Lord Jesus Christ, then I want to tell you today that, that God reaches towards you with an everlasting love. God reaches towards you in amazing mercy and grace, and God extends to you the offer and the opportunity for peace in your heart by trusting in the, work, the accomplished and finished work of His Son, Jesus, on the cross. So we see here a people of purpose in that they are a called people. They're the church. They're called out by God. They're a conquered people in that their hearts have been conquered by the love and the grace and the peace that comes through a relationship with God through His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Now, where are you in that equation this morning? Are you someone who also senses that you're part of the church, part of this movement, that God has called into existence, God has called into being by those who've placed their faith in His Son, Jesus? Are you part of something that is larger than yourselves, part of something that is, that is kingdom-driven, kingdom-oriented? Are you living in the fullness of God's grace and, and His peace in your heart and in your life because you've come to the place personally where you've trusted Jesus as your Savior and received the forgiveness of sin and the right standing with God that comes through that? If not, then that's an offering, that's an opportunity that God wants to extend to you today because that would move you from a people without purpose to becoming a people with purpose. So we have a people of purpose here. What, what, what else about them helps us to recognize that, that they stand in readiness to face resistance? Well, the second thing is this. We see as we continue to read about them that they were a people who were prepared for pressure. That they, they lived in the realization of pressure upon their lives. To be part of the church in the ancient world was to live with a realization that pressure was going to come to bear at some place, at some point, from some source. And, and so they, they wanted to live their lives in a way where they would be prepared for that. And Paul explains what that looks like. Look at what he says in verse 3. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is fitting. Then he gives two reasons for that gratitude. He says, because your faith grows exceedingly and the love of every one of you all abounds toward each other. Now, right there, you, we find the two aspects, the two elements of, of preparation for pressure that are, that are real in their lives. The first one is this. We see that they have a, a, an ongoing spiritual development that unfolds in their lives. Look at what Paul says again. He says, it is fitting because your faith grows exceedingly. Now, let me tell you, in those words, your faith grows exceedingly you find there God's design, God's desire, and yes, God's expectation for your life as a believer. God expects and desires and designs that our faith should grow. He, he wants us to be ever deepening and developing in our spiritual life. But I want to say this. It's not just that God desires and designs your life to grow, but that that faith should grow exceedingly. That that should be something that, that supersedes and overrules every other area of development in your life. Now, now many of us, we pursue development and growth in a lot of different arenas. We may pursue development and growth in our professional life, in our relational life, in our recreational life, wherever we may find opportunity to develop and grow. There, there are some people that actually will go out to a, a golf course, to a driving range, and they'll stay out there for hours. And they'll hit that ball over and over and over and over. You get it, right? And I'm like, if I could hit it on a driving range, I could hit it down the course. Why do you need the driving range? Well, I'm not that interested in spending that much time and energy to develop that part of my life. I probably should be, but I'm not. Others are. But what I'm saying to us is that we give attention and we give energy and we give time and we give effort to developing the parts of our lives that are important to us. And whenever Paul writes to the Thessalonian Christians who were living in this, 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 this very hot spot, of persecution and trial, he saw in them someone who was willing to work excessively hard to develop their spiritual lives because it was important to them for spiritual survival, for their church to continue. And so they had this ongoing spiritual development that was very important. So out of gratitude, Paul calls attention and he says to them, your faith grows exceedingly. Now what if Paul was looking at your life? What if Paul was looking at mine? Would he say something similar to that about us? Would he be able to commend us for our constant spiritual deepening, for our growth, for our development? How does, how does, what does this look like? Well, as he looked at them, this was not something that, that was a subjective thing. There had to be some objective data, some objective evidence. So, so certainly it, it comes to bear with, I think, the, the recognition of increased knowledge 
of God's word and who God is, as you grow in your, your spiritual life, that means that you gain greater insight and greater understanding of who God is. And, and that comes by spending time in his word. By, by going back to his word over and over and over again, just like th those folks hit that golf ball over and over and over again. You go back to the word of God. You learn it. You let it sink into your life. You let it challenge you. You let it change you. You let it transform you. Increased knowledge. I think effective evangelism is another aspect of it. We realize that we are sent on a mission to the world to explain to them and to try to proclaim to them the, the glories of, of God's grace and mercy brought to bear on their lives through His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we spend ourselves trying to win people to faith in Christ. Amen. I'll say amen even if you won't. Because that's what we ought to be doing, folks. We're, we're, we're commissioned to go into the world in the name of Jesus and to tell people that he died on the cross so that their sins could be forgiven and that their names could be written in the Lamb's book of life and they could spend eternity with him forever. We're commissioned to do that. And so we need to go. And it also, I think, is visible in the fact that we make mature disciples for Jesus. We we talk about discipleship here, and we work at trying to do some of that, but some of us just sit back, and we kind of say, oh, well, that's not for me. But yeah, let me just be very blunt with you. If you're a child of God, if you've been saved by the grace of God, you're called to be a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ, plain and simple. You can't avoid it. You might deny it. You might ignore it. But the fact is that Scripture says that we're called to be followers of Jesus, disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that, that means that, that whatever it takes to bring us to a place where our lives are deepening and maturing, whatever it takes to bring us to a place where we're motivated to be God's witnesses out in the world, that's what we need to be willing to do. And, and it's a challenge, but that's what's before us. So, <clears throat> prepared for pressure. First of all, there's an ongoing spiritual development. The second part of being able to be prepared for pressure is found in that second phrase, the love of every one of you all abounds toward each other. This is speaking about the necessity of a strong community of faith, a, a church family, if you will. He says they were abounding in love for each other. And that's a, that's a, great, that's a great home life, Right? Whenever the people of God find in, in community with each other the opportunity to, to give and receive abounding love for each other, uh, amazing, overwhelming love for each other, this talks about a strength of fellowship that, that is so real and so vital and so vibrant that, that it provides shelter when the resistance comes, when the storms hit the, the, the family of faith, the body of Christ, the, the church that abounds in love for each other provides shelter for those storms. It provides encouragement when the onslaught becomes unbearable. See, the truth is that we need each other. We need each other. And, 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 if, and if, if persecution or resistance or opposition ramps up, which it may, we're going to need each other more and more. And so there needs to be this strong commitment and this strong connection in the body of Christ that we have. We don't need to hang out on the fringes. We need to be building relationships and strengthening those relationships, loving each other, reaching out to each other, caring for each other. So facing resistance in readiness. A people of purpose can face resistance in readiness. A people who are prepared for pressure can face resistance in readiness. Third, a people who are proved and approved can face resistance in readiness. I, I love verse 4 and, and verse 5. Listen to what Paul says. He, he talks about their development and their, their community, the strength of their community. He says, so that we ourselves boast of you among the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure. What he says here is that as he looks at the Thessalonian church, that he sees a cause for boasting. Now, we know that boasting can be a negative thing, right? Whenever somebody begins to call attention to themselves, look at me. How many of you are just really excited and turned on by that kind of a thought? Look what I did. Man, I am so great. We, we just don't go there at all. 
And that's not the kind of boasting that Paul is talking about here. He's not talking about a braggadocious kind of thing, but he's saying that, that your, your faith and your strength and, and your ability to be patient, to persevere in the midst of suffering and persecution is, is so exemplary. It's so exemplary that I'm willing to put that in front of other churches and to say, here's how it's supposed to look. Here's how it's supposed to be done. So that they have a, an exemplary endurance. They, they stand before others as an example. Paul says, your endurance, your perseverance, your patience, and your faith in the midst of persecutions and tribulations is something that's worthy of calling attention to. Patience, basically, in this context, is talking about the ability to bear up under intense pressure. And so what he says about them is that whenever, whenever the pressure's on, you were able to withstand that pressure. You were able to press on without wavering. You, you withstood when resistance came along and tried to topple you. The nature of our patience in the fires of adversity is something that has to be built up before those fires come. Or when those fires come, they will burn us away like so much dross, like weeds. The truth is that whenever Paul speaks about their endurance, he's speaking about something that has come to them because of their ongoing spiritual development and the strength of community that they have as a church. That's how they're able to stand. They're, they're spiritually deep, so that when the winds blow, it can't move them. They're spiritually broad in that they have a community that encourages each other and lifts each other up and prays for each other whenever the storms come. And so it can't be toppled. So they, have, they provide and present exemplary endurance. Paul says this is a cause for boasting. So the, their, their, their faith and their patience have been proved in the fires of adversity. But then that follows with a divine affirmation. Look at what happens in verse number five. He said, which is manifest evidence. That means that's plain evidence of what? Of the righteous judgment of God and that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you also suffer. What he's saying here is very simple. He says that, that, that your ability to withstand when, re, when resistance comes, when pressure, pressure and persecution rise up against you, he said your ability to do that it really does two things. Number one, it, it shows, it's plain evidence that God's judgments are right. The manifest evidence of the righteous judgment of God, that God's judgments are right. It's plain evidence that His ways are perfect, that His precepts will stand the test of time, that His, pre his precepts and His principles will withstand the attack of adversaries. That, that no matter what, what the world brings against the truth of God's word, it can't shake it. God's judgments are right. But it also tells us that whenever we stand on those, that we receive the divine affirmation of being counted worthy of the kingdom of God. Worthy of the kingdom of God. Now, wouldn't you like those words to be etched across your tombstone? He lived a life that was worthy of the kingdom of God. She lived a life that was worthy of the kingdom of God. What is that speaking about? It's talking about a kingdom that God has, is, is, is in the process of, of calling us into. When, when we become the church, we become part of the kingdom of God. And, and the kingdom of God is something that is both a present and a yet-to-come reality. It, it's here now. It's here now in places, in spots. We're part of that kingdom. But the kingdom of God will ultimately come in all of its glory. And we will have a, an opportunity to live in, in our, our lives forever in the presence of God in His kingdom. And when, this, when the scripture speaks about a time when the kingdoms of this world have all become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and forever, we will be his people. He will be our God. We will bow before him as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And I want you to know that he says whenever you live a life that, that, is, that is filled with the manifest evidence of, of God's presence, of God's develop, of, of spiritual development, and of God's grace brought to bear on your life, then he says you will be counted worthy of that kingdom. I want that. I want that for our church, and I want to tell you if the storms of adversity come, and when they come, I want us all to be able to say, you know what? Our lives became manifest evidence 
that God's judgments are right and that we were worthy of his kingdom. So we want to remain in readiness. We want to be able to say, ready or not, absolutely I'm ready. Whatever the world brings, I'm going to do my best to stand. And having done all, I'm going to stand. Why? Because I worship a king who is above all. I worship a king who is the Lord of lords, the king of kings. He's unshakable. Now, let me give you real quickly three quick reasons to remain in readiness. And we'll be done. The first reason to remain in readiness is because we face an uncertain future. Now, that's not something that's changed from last week to this week, by the way. It it may be more questionable for some of us, we think. But I'm telling you that the future is questionable. We we have no idea what tomorrow's going to bring. We have no idea what next week or next month or next year is going to bring. But I can tell you this, that if we are linked, connected strongly by faith to the one who holds the future, then it really doesn't matter what the future brings. So we want to stay strong by staying connected by faith to him. We face an uncertain future, so we need to remain in readiness. Secondly, we stand before a sustained pressure against the things of God. We don't have to look very far. We don't have to be rocket scientists or geniuses of any sort to realize that the world is coming after the church. It just is. And if you don't see that, then, then there's a, a blindness, uh, there's a, a, an inability or a, a lack of desire to see because the world's coming after the church. And, and, and its goal is not just to neutralize it. Its goal is not just to demoralize it. Its goal is to destroy it. And so we better be ready because there's going to be a sustained pressure from now till the Lord comes back. And Scripture says it's only going to intensify. Like the birth pains, it's only going to intensify third reason that we should remain ready is because we have a sure hope see our hope is not in the kingdoms of this world our hope is in the king the lord jesus and he's promised us that that when you endure that you have the potential to receive the crown of righteousness which he gives to all those who love his appearing and I want to tell you, that's worth, that's worth readiness, that's worth enduring, that's worth living for. It's even worth dying for. Now, I want to kind of go back to where we started, and I want to, to speak about a sad reality. Whenever Paul wrote this, he initially said very straightforward, this is to the church. Now, what that means is that for everybody whose life is connected by faith to the Lord Jesus Christ, This is a word for you. That's not a sad reality. That's a great word. The sad reality is that there are far more people to whom that doesn't apply than to whom it does. Because there are many, many more people in this world, there are many more people on this planet that do not have faith in Jesus Christ, that are not part of his church because they've never trusted Jesus as their Savior. And so this word is not for you. But it can be. This word can be for you. If you come to the place in your life where you hear the voice of Jesus as he speaks in the person of his Holy Spirit and in the power of his word, as he reminds you that what he did on the cross was for you, that his death there when he died was to bring to you an opportunity to be forgiven of your sin and to have your your entire life hidden with God in Christ for all of eternity. And and all you have to do is come to the place where you say yes to Jesus as he offers you that gift of his grace and his mercy. You say, yes, Lord, I want that. I trust that. I believe in that. I receive that gift from you. Please forgive me for my sin. Please take my sin away. Please place my name in your Lamb's book of life. Please, please give me eternity in your presence forever. And if you ask him with sincerity in your heart, he'll do that. And that's going to set you on a path. It's going to set you on a path where you become called. It's going to set you on a path where you become conquered by the love and grace of God. It's going to set you on a path where you begin to pursue a life of growth and development under God. 
It's going to set you on a path where you become part of a community of faith that is strong and abounding in love for each other. It's going to set you on a path where you can become proved by remaining strong in the face of fires of trial and, and tribulation. It's going to set you a path, on a path where you can see that the testimonies of God are sure. The way of God is right. And your life will change forever. But you have to take that first step. As he presents to you himself, say, yes, Lord, here I am. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads, please. The moments before us, I just want us to individually, personally, consider and contemplate what God might be saying to us today. First, as a believer, am I ready or not? Is my life growing and developing under God? Am I where I need to be with you, Lord? If not, maybe today a prayer of just repentance and renewal is in order for you where you just say, Lord, I want to shore up my faith this morning. I want to get back on track. I want to renew my commitment to you. I want to rededicate my life and all of its parts. That'd be a great, that'd be a great thing to do right here today. Maybe you're here and you're not part of the church. You're not a believer. You've never trusted Jesus. And today you hear the voice of God saying, come to me, come to me. Trust me, believe on me, receive my son. And you say, I'd like to do that. Today it'd be wonderful for you just to begin to call out to Jesus right now and to ask him to be your savior. Maybe there are other things that you need to, to be doing business with God about today. I don't know your personal life. I don't know what's going on between you and, 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 and the Lord, but he knows and you know. So right where you are, you can just begin to, to whisper a prayer to him. And I want to say to you that if there's anything, anything that you need help with, please let us know that. We're here to help you today. Uh, we're ready to answer any question we can. And so if there's an issue, a question, whatever you might have, the staff, ministerial, ministerial staff will be out in the foyer. But if there's any question, please don't, let it, don't, don't go away without having those questions resolved. Father, in Jesus' name we come. We pray to you. We plead with you to speak to us in such a way that we know that you are able and willing to make us ready for any resistance that might come. So speak to us now.